It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. This is Access of Easy, number 299. Unbelievable, Len. 299 times someone has done this, not you and me. <laughs> my name is Joey. That is Len. Uh, lots to talk about this week, buddy. How the heck are you? I'm good, Joey. How many have we done? Mm, this is 17, I think. All right, so, so we're 17 in the book. Yeah, so everything's good here. How about you? Everything all right? Everything's all right. We're both lying. Both of us are getting sick, as we t- talked about in the 30 seconds before we came on air. <laughs> this, is really, this episode is sponsored by uh, that Robitussin DM, whatever they call it. <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's all about the easy DNS, and I'm proudly wearing this shirt once again. <laughs> I will boy. always wear it on this show if I can. Make sure I've got to do the laundry just in time. So, yeah. We'll... we'll uh, We'll we'll talk about shirts maybe another time tonight. A uh, couple things. First of all, this is the audio companion to the uh, weekly Easy DNS podcast. You can get over at accessofeasy dot com. So if you want to do the podcast plus the newsletter, if you want to read all the stories we're talking about, uh, plus there's always a few things we don't touch on at the bottom of the uh, the bottom of the release. You know, elsewhere on the internet. So take some time, subscribe, and of course you can get this anywhere you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And uh, Len, the quote of the week this week, a bit of a an interesting one from last week. We'll start with, I guess the uh, da, 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 here it is. In individuals, insanity is rare, but in groups, parties, nations, and epochs, it is the rule. That was by Frederick Nietzsche or Nietzsche, I guess, depending on who you ask. No one got that surprisingly. Uh, actually, it's not surprising. I heard the quote, but I didn't know who said it. This week's quote, Len. I'm not going to enter the contest, and you can't enter it either. But both of us could take this one home. Bitcoin is a swarm of cyber hornets swerving the goddess swerving serving the goddess of wisdom feeding on the fire of truth exponentially growing ever smarter faster and stronger behind a wall of encrypted energy uh rules as always don't look it up don't google it and absolutely do not send a message to me or len because we will not help you first person that gets it gets their domain hosting renewal on easy dns so if you want uh mark and crew to pay for your stuff you know how to do it every week get the quote be the first one to get it and uh, post in the comments Buddy, we got a jam-packed release this week, starting with uh, a guy near and dear to your heart, RFK. I don't know if you're going to start there, but if you are, let's get into it. No, it's for top of the list. We'll have to start with it, number one. And well, there was a Bitcoin conference that took place in Miami. And for those who aren't aware, this, just like every year, attended by thousands of people, media, Bitcoiners, and everybody in between showed up. And the focus of the story that I'm going to be discussing is what well, was on the main stage over there and that was rfk jr and he was at the conference and he was able to deliver a speech a moving speech at that many bitcoiners loved it it was a very well said speech and he, by doing so because he is running for but ultimately to be president of the united states he's trying to become the democratic nominee He's talking about Bitcoin and he's talking about Bitcoin in a favorable light. And he's talking about even accepting Bitcoin as for sponsorships, sorry, for donations. And while this is bringing Bitcoin to mainstream politics and in his speech, there were six points in there. I'm not going to go through them all, but notably the, the two things that are most important to Bitcoiners are the fact that he's going to endorse the right to own and hold Bitcoin number one, and the second is to run a node. And for those who are unaware, a node is a software that continuously runs and it verifies that the protocol is running as it should and nobody is going against the protocol. Now, RFK Jr. was also mentioning that uh, he, he found Bitcoin after what happened in Ottawa last year. And we had a trucker protest that took place and it ended up sometime around February 2022, and everybody knows what's happened, I hope. And for those who are not aware, well, the government decided to ensure that the, the heavy hand was uh, dropped on these people and some of their bank accounts were frozen as a result. So in this whole thing shows that Bitcoin being used as donations could get around this whole, well, decentralized approach by governments. 
And the fact now we have Bitcoin in the mainstream, RFK Jr. talking about it and accepting donations, you have that side of the fence. But on the opposite side, you have people like Liz Warren, and she's still trying to recruit people in her anti-crypto army. I think it's an army of two people right now. So you now have these opposing sides in major political spheres in the United States. Bitcoin is now being political for better or for worse. This is the reality of it. And I'll leave it at that, Joey. I don't have a lot to say about RFK. It's been, you know, hashed and rehashed, no pun intended there for the Bitcoin crowd uh, since the speech. Standing room only, as is evidenced in the pictures there, a couple from P BJ Dichter and I think one other from, uh, I want to say, Lawrence Lepard, yeah, in the article. So, look, two things, okay? One, Bitcoin is a political issue now. Uh, DeSantis mentioned it in his announcement yesterday on Twitter, and uh, it's come up a number of times in popular political circles over the years. If it's coming up when the price is 27,000, whatever it is, 28,000, 26,000, it's going to come up when the price is 100. And on the way there, there's going to be many, many stops and many, many politicians who may or may not be sincere in their views and their uh, allegiance to Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. Now, the second thing I want to leave you with is this. People talk all the time about voting blocks, you know, intersectionality of people who are, uh, you know, likely or unlikely to cast votes certain directions for certain colors and certain party lines. And you know, I, I would say that single mothers and working families, blue collar, white collar, high education, low education, high income, low income, those are all big voting blocks. But the biggest voting block is the non-voter. And I think the voting, uh, the non-voter, I should say, I think is overwhelmingly comprised of people who are interested in Bitcoin and Bitcoin related principles, libertarian principles. Um, to me, this is the voting block that serious candidates need to be looking at. And We'll see if RFK gets, you know, any real press. I doubt he, he will. CNN, you know, really got shellacked for having Trump on there, who is a front runner. Uh, I doubt very much that they'll give RFK a platform, though. Um, I do think RFK will get a platform in other places. He was on the All In podcast. He's obviously doing the Bitcoin conference. There'll be other opportunities for him to spread his message and speak about the things that he holds near and dear and some of the policy positions his administration would take. So. Bitcoin, uh, yeah, man, you know, obviously for you and I, this is a no brainer, maybe for the access of easy crowd, this could be, a, you know, sort of first foray into something like this on, on the political scene. But I would say that it's best to start getting familiar. Uh, you can listen to our show, the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast, you can read books, you can uh, listen to other podcasts, watch other YouTube videos, whatever. But to not know about this, I think is to miss at least part of the puzzle when it comes to deciding who you're going to vote for in 2024, which, you know, by all accounts, and I don't often say this, though many other people do. I would say, by all accounts, this is going to be a pretty important election in the United States. Uh, so it's good to know exactly what you're what you're looking at, what you're talking about. It's always the most important compared to. That's everyone says that. I have never said that, and but this one I actually think is like somewhat like more important than most. I would say. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Feels like four that. years. We'll say the same thing. So, <laughs> well, let's move on. And there is a easy DNS sponsored podcast which is originating in, from the uk it's called trigonometry and i've never heard of trigonometry the the podcast before it's not a small show by any stretch of no, the it's huge. It's huge. Uh, 547 000 followers on youtube so the fact that i never heard of it doesn't mean anything this is just validating that fact uh they have more than a few videos too on youtube i took a peek that have over a million plays that is very good and it shows they have a low achieved a level of success that even we have never achieved as of yet. And they've had some really big names on their show, including people like Jordan Peterson, and he's made multiple appearances on that show. But the sad thing about Trigonometry, the podcast or YouTube show, or whatever you're going to call it, they had their account closed by the UK FinTrack company Tide. And they scrubbed them clean, it looks like, and they're no longer able to collect any more. <laughs> I was just hoping you, had, I was hoping you had one ready for that, and you absolutely <laughs> delivered. Way to go. <laughs> so, And they did this with no explanation. So that basically, they've shunned them out from collecting any money through the traditional financial systems. And what is noted here, there is, up until the point where they had their, their accounts closed, they say that they had a healthy balance and transaction history. So it's not like that they were on the verge of bankruptcy or anything, and and they're just making transactions sporadically. No, this is a legitimate business, it seems. And this was even taken to Twitter and tied to their credit, replied back to them saying they're working on the matter with the highest priority. So this is good that it's been brought to their attention. 
But the fact that they're still able to close these accounts arbitrarily without explanation, it's very concerning. However, Mark, the guy behind EZDS, he is looking to see if they will be able to take payment in Bitcoin. And it kind of, it's a good transition from the first story. And it just goes to show you, trying to get off these centralized services is the way to go. The truckers had some real problems with the donations. I think Gifts Sends Go was one of them. And I forget the other one, but whatever it was, uh, they closed those things down. But Bitcoin always works. And in this case, if they are going to transition to, instead of taking fiat money, but take Bitcoin, they could still continue operating, doing business and collecting money. It just goes to show you that there is a desire and there's a need to use Bitcoin. It's too bad tri trigonometry had to learn this way because this is a, a very harsh lesson, but we may have made Bitcoiners as a result. Do it, Mark. You could do it. I think the two trigon trigonometry guys are good candidates. I mean, Len, they really, you, you never listened to the show. Um, and to be honest, I'm not a regular listener, though it is on my subscription, my list. Uh, the, the thing that I would say is that if there's any two guys who are more qualified than them to see the writing on the wall, I don't know who they are. Uh, they do a podcast with people who are deplatformed, uh, de-jobbed, uh, removed from banking systems, removed from monetary systems, you know, de-economized de basically as contributing members of society and, uh, of the GDP. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I think the most surprising thing is that this has not happened before. Um, it's hard to do this to a big show, but a lot easier to do it to a budding show of this nature. Now, on the Bitcoin side of things, you and I have obviously had struggles we've had over the years with our bank accounts. And, you know, it's funny. It doesn't seem like like even the, as you mentioned, like sort of the FinTrack, you know, kin organizations are interested in talking to, playing ball. Although there is like a token tweet, oh, we're going to look into this. Only one of two things can be true, right? Either you let an activist employee of your organization jump the gun on a bad day when they, you know, couldn't get their triple caramel macchiato on the way into the office and, and, and you know, turf these guys or the organization itself as a, as a position, this is what they've done. And in either case, you, you can't have this when it comes to people's money, because when you're talking about people's money, you're talking about their livelihood. This is the way the economy works. It's the way the system works until we find an alternative. Uh, and I think there's an adjacent one budding, now over in the Bitcoin space. So let's see. I'm interested in seeing how this plays out. I'm going to tune into their next show and I'd like to hear them talk about it. Maybe I missed that episode already, but um, I'm interested in hearing what they have to say because those guys have a huge platform, Len. I believe they have a line to Rogan and guys of that ilk as well. So let's uh, let's see what comes of this. I, I don't think it's going to, you know, they're not going to go down without a fight. That's for sure. Yeah, they pissed off the wrong people. So yeah, let's see what happens. Moving on, the Foreign Intelligence Surve Surveillance Court they have released a finding that is very interesting. And this is to do with the FBI. And this info was ultimately released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So we have three different state actors here. And this could easily be made into a children's book with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court being the snake, the FBI is the pig, and the Office <laughs> of the Director of National Intelligence as the rat. I, I think this is a, it's a great story that could be written. Anyways, the FBI, they improperly made use of a database that they have collected of foreign intelligence. And they used this database a number of times, 278,000 times. If you think about it, if you do a thousand times a day, it's going to be three quarters <laughs> of a year that they're going to be used. Like that's that's a lot of times. And parts of the, the probe, it shows that these, these searches were done between 2016 and 2020. So it's a four year period of time. And it, unfortunately, these rules, sorry, these uh, searches, they violated rules because there was, quote, no reasonable basis to expect they would return foreign intelligence or evidence of crime. So how are they arbitrarily picking people? Are they throwing darts on a board? Are you going through an old phone book to see who they're going to be screwing <laughs> over this time? And what are they doing with this information? And the fact that this was released, I wonder how much information has not been released by these state actors over there because uh, you know you do something like this and it's brought to our attention you're just, you know you basically look at the tip of the iceberg there's so much more under the water and who knows what they're surveilling who they're surveilling how long how many times and for what purpose this is really scary stuff 
I think they're probably looking first and foremost, Len, for guys who produce anti-fiat currency content and who cut their own hair, who do it from their basement. Wouldn't you say that's a good candidate for uh, search and seizure, some, some, and ex- executing an illegal search like this or what? Yeah, well, my name is Pablo, and uh, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay, okay I'm, we're not going to drag this out because we beat this horse to death every time there's a story like this. I would just ask you one question. What is appropriate use of a database like this? There isn't an appropriate use of something that's this broad reaching. Are you really telling me that the FBI and these other lettered agencies are so incompetent that they have to grab information and continue to dip into this pool? Uh, what was it? 300, just a little shy of 300,000 times, 278,000 times over and over and over again. For what? If either either you're looking for new people every time and you got to work on your search priorities, or you're searching for the same people every time and you got to work on your search skills. Like what, these, there's only again. I feel like I say this on this show more than I say it on the other show. There's only two outcomes here. Neither of them are good, but one of them has to be true. This is a great example of not surprising but disappointing all the same from uh, a once you know probably pristine agency. Maybe the day it was established. I don't know what after that, but anyway, <laughs> let's talk about smearing another. Not agency, but a company, LinkedIn. And I'll be brief on this one, but it looks like LinkedIn is censoring speech. Never heard of them doing this before, I'll be perfectly honest. It's the first time I've come across this. And this is being done to an individual named Ben Sellers. And Buddy here is from Headline USA. And he came under the eye of LinkedIn after he wrote a post that put down the New York Times. And he perceived that there was fake coverage in the Durham report. That's the the Trump investigation for the Russia gate, I think. Is that what it is? Um, Yeah. Whatever it is. New York Times, they ended up getting a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, Mr. Sellers was (laughs) suggesting maybe they give up the Pulitzer Prize because uh, it was basically reporting on a Russian uh, collusion of hoax. Uh, So it's not nothing there really to say that anything that should be reported on. And so after voicing his displeasure, well, LinkedIn decided to ban sellers from the platform over there. Now, it just goes to show you another one of these centralized platforms, depending on who's running it, who's managing it, they could dictate the message they want to have displayed on their platform. They have the right to do so. They set it up. They paid for it. And it's ultimately they have the call in this. But it goes to show you that relying on these services Ultimately, it's going to be detrimental for the message because they could censor whatever they want and push another message, whatever they want. And that doesn't maybe say the whole truth. It could show half the truth or maybe none of the truth. And that's too bad that LinkedIn, I never really thought of them as being one to censor information, but here's a story that they did it. And man, uh, I never signed up for them and I probably never will. You never thought about them being a company that censors information. I I never thought about them at all. You know, I, I don't know who who even uses LinkedIn. Like, what kind of boomer tech? Like, who, who gives a shit? So, oh, sorry, no swearing on this program. But yeah, like, who who cares? Like, does it even matter? The the thing I would ask people who want to use LinkedIn, if you if you're looking to share, like, it's a professional. Is it not a professional network? It is, right? It was when it came out years ago. It was like the professional Facebook. I'm sure it still is. If you're looking to share stuff like this, the last place I would share it is on LinkedIn. Could you imagine going to the lunchroom and being like, hey? Did you guys hear about the Durham report? Total scam, total hoax. Like, buddy, no one's going to sit with you while you cut up your salami and cheese if this is what you're talking about. Don't do this on LinkedIn. Go do it on Twitter. Use the hashtags. Get people to come in. Throw some likes. Throw some memes. LinkedIn ain't the place for this regardless. I sympathize with the guy. No one should be using LinkedIn anyways. But come on, man. We Think about this. Come on. Come on. You, Maybe you're banned from Twitter. Guy, Len? God, I, yeah, you, I don't think Twitter <laughs> I don't I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking on the about wall or something. Put a mural up. Anything but we'll, this. We'll be talking about Twitter uh, next story and again later on about banning people. But the next story, uh, there's a new feature being rolled out by Twitter, and it, it is encrypted direct messages or DMs. I, I haven't yet seen it on mine. I'm not sure if you saw it on yours. And uh, so it, it looks like this rollout is being done selectively, and I don't know how they're disc- or not discriminating how they're choosing the people to get it first. But verified. It's only. interesting. That's how. So it looks, this is pretty cool. And it, I like this in the sense it might deter users from moving to other networks like Signal, Telegram, or something else that is perceived to be secure when sending private message and messages. And if Twitter is going to be the place that you could start doing it, good for them because they could attract a new set of audience or keep a set of audience from going somewhere else. And for people that are looking forward to this, to receive an encrypted DM, the person receiving the message 
has to be following the person. So you just can't randomly send out these encrypted right. messages. They both have to be following each other. So no, none of these, like, how's your trade going is going to be done. And another thing that is notable is it's going to be an opt-in feature. I, and I don't know who would not want to opt-in. Are you, su you suggesting that by opting in, you might be under scrutiny or something? I, I don't know. I can't see any negative for opting in. I wouldn't totally replace signal or telegram or whatever but it's a good alternative to have i, I like it it's uh, i do you have any other spin on this because it seems like it's an interesting way of, of moving moving forward two things one i totally agree with your take on everyone should opt in i don't see why not either you think that the encryption is not strong enough you know if that's the case and you shouldn't be using twitter dms at all i would understand that if you didn't use the service for that at all but the thing i view as more important is that alongside this announcement a week or two ago uh, Musk was saying that he's going to roll out voice calls as well. So you're going to be able to call people on Twitter. Now that's important as far as encryption. I think you'd want to have that stuff sealed up and that's going to be a lot more useful. There's a lot of messaging apps. You're really diluting the sort of, you know, choice pool here, adding another one, but you know, Len for a platform that's going to have by the end of this year, let's say, uh, banking at some level, messaging and calling plus Twitter core. And trading, they're, they're going to be allowing trading eToro and that. It's not, yeah, so and that at some level, like you know, he's getting pretty close to making good on that promise that he was going to have the uh, whatever that Chinese app is, WeChat, right? Of America. The question is, can he avoid the same problems that the honeypot, you know, gave them? I'm, I'm not sure. He's definitely a more he's he's a more anti-government fella than most um but let's see you know when push comes to shove and push will really come to shove for him i think in the next few years between the cars and the platform um let's see let's see how he does with it but yeah i mean opt in why not right do it that's he's gonna move to el salvador <laughs> that's what yeah, the maybe. whole operation there i don't know somewhere else but well let's keep moving on there is a new phishing as a service a pass tool and this is going to give inexperienced hackers out there uh, they could include some quote some of the most uh, some of most advanced aspects of their operations. So you could give these inexperienced hackers abilities now to really build on things without having very much experience to begin with. It's like giving a sports car to a novice driver and giving these rookies and wannabe hackers the tools to commit cybercrime. It, it's it's really going to be simpl simplified because they're going to be automating this, the steps to fool the victims. And one of the ways they're saying is there's going to be the de deploying of highly convincing and login pages. So you're going to have login pages that look like they're a real McCoy and it's going to have the victim's email address already pre-filled, but the page isn't real because they're getting the information from the website like um, Office 365 or Microsoft 365. And so when the victim inputs the password, it gets directed right to the hacker's database and they secure that and then they're able to go off to the races so th this is going to be this uh, along with ai it's giving a lot more people opportunities to be a hacker or a cyber criminal and really you just have to have your guard up with respect to just randomly entering your password on any website make sure if you're clicking a link it's legitimate you, see, you could easily tell by just hovering the mouse over it or just if you're on a phone just holding your your finger over it and it will show you show you what the link is and if it's if you're hypothetically you're going to log on to microsoft and it doesn't say www.microsoft.com at the very beginning don't do it especially if it doesn't say https colon slash slash don't do it because then it's not secure be careful learn how to, to practice good privacy it only makes sense it's good this thing is going to be more prevalent moving forward and you know if you have any older people out there that is online you may want to just alert them of the fact that this thing is going to be targeting them because they're probably the most susceptible to being attacked in my opinion can't can't the browser autofill feature uh combat this i, I honestly think sometimes len not on my daily driver but on the computer well my daily driver does other stuff like you know it does the show but on the the home computer here uh, and my work computer too, to be honest with you, the autocomplete does a lot of work for me, um, whether I'm buying something, whether I'm putting in a password, whatever. And I always, I, I take a pause if like, for example, okay, let's say if uh, I have like a loading problem with a website and if my password doesn't autocomplete, I stop everything I'm doing and I double check that address. I double check you, like you mentioned HTTPS among other things to make sure that I'm in the, in the right place and I didn't get man in the middle somehow. And, uh, you know, so far I've been lucky, but it seems to me that this kind of stuff, 
you know, it's been floating around for a long time. I remember when I was in high school, one of the kids uh, who was, you know, a friend of mine then, good, good friend of mine now, still one of my best friends, used to invite people to his house and he had this thing coded up that his computer teacher at the time told them how to make. And it was a Hotmail login screen. And you would put your email and your password in and then it would fill both to a text file and then display an error message um, uh, as soon as you pressed enter. That was, that was like, you know, 2002 probably. I mean, this is, it may seem complex, but nothing is new that's not been forgotten. And this is a great example of that. Like, just pay attention, man. Don't, don't sleepwalk through life. A lot of stuff we talk about on this show, you, if you weren't sleepwalking, you'd probably be a lot better off, whether it's downloading files, opening files, or in this case, putting your username and password. Let's move on. Taylor Lorenz. And, uh, you know, we haven't really talked about her on our show we, very much. I know, we? I know a lot about Taylor Lorenz because I spend a way too much time listening to the Red Scare podcast, which is a guilty pleasure of mine. I don't recommend <laughs> anyone do it. Honestly, it's like mind numbing, but is that <laughs> her it. podcast? Is she, is no. she a host? Or no, it's the furthest thing from her podcast. Okay. I'm not aware. But anyway, sh she's angered at uh, Elon Musk. And she's, well, the reason why she's pissed is because Elon is activating several banned accounts. And she claims that by doing so, he is, quote, opening the gates of hell. Is that an overstatement? Is that <laughs> hyperbole? Like, is, that this, is it really going to be that bad? Anyways, we learned that Lorenz was the catalyst behind several bans. And this was done under the previous Twitter regime. And this was done during the Twitter files. And she, she you know, the fact that she's behind all that, or at least part of the reason why some of these accounts were banned, um, it goes to show you that maybe it's, they're going to be looking out for some blood moving forward. And one of the previously banned accounts called Fear the Fluff, they detailed her life as a Manhattan rich girl who attended a Swiss boarding school. I had no idea that was the case. Uh, she always, I guess, perceived to be you know somebody of the people. But going to a Swiss boarding school, that's pretty damn cool. And you have to have money to do that. But according to the, the now deactivated account, Lorenz was able to get rid of a lot of the information that was online because her uncle owns the Internet Archive, uh, the website. So all the stores that sorry, all the website that was stored on there, he was able to remove it. So anything to, to do with her past. It's been scrubbed off the internet because of her connection with the with the person who owns the internet archive. So really interesting story, and she's gonna really rattle the cages. She's she's one that doesn't sit uh, sit down and take things lightly. Uh, if they're gonna come after her, this is gonna be a, a war. It's gonna be fun to watch. I hope nobody gets hurt in the end. But having people banned discrimination, like it's almost a discrimination in a way, uh, if, especially if you don't like somebody, that's not the way to do it. If they do something that's heinous, maybe, but man, oh man, they, she's done a lot of things that were bad and it looks like some of these are going to come back to bite her. So let's see what happens. I detest Taylor Lorenz. Uh, I have for a long time. If you want to have some fun learning about Taylor Lorenz and get some fun takes, maybe the Red Scare podcast is for you. They, not every episode is free, but you can find a way to pirate it if you want. As far as this story goes, okay, the thing to take away from this is fear the floof is doing something that the the liberal media has done to many people, especially over the last you know seven eight years, basically since Trump derangement um, came on the scene. You know, lest we forget that the same people and Taylor Lorenz is is in the mainstream media. Okay, I believe she works for the Washington Post. Her sister is Brooke Lorenz of CNN, uh, who also runs a um, I think a an, another age. It's an agency or a publicity company, I forget. But that aside, you know, don't forget that these people were doxing, going to the homes of, uh, knocking on the doors of anyone with a Trump flag, anyone at a Trump rally, anyone at anything that was against any mainstream narrative, popular narrative for almost a decade, Len. And so I got a hard time feeling sorry for Lorenz when she's made an, a concerted effort to protect her privacy at every chance, every opportunity, every turn. And, you know, now it's so bad that one of the running jokes out there is no one knows how old she is. She honestly, if you, and if you look at her, she could be 35. She could be 50. I have no idea. And uh, a lot of people are trying to find out more about her. This Fear the Floof guy points out a couple of important things here. The, the key thing, and it's a thread that goes through a lot of guys. He talks about Carlos Mazza, the Vox guy, and a few others. I, this is an account I've heard of before, but uh, not one that I'm familiar with for Lorenz. The thing that, to keep in mind is that all these guys who pretend to be you know, for the people, by the people types, they're all fucking rich kids. Every single one of them. Every single one of these people is born into money, 
comes from money, goes to Swiss boarding schools or the equivalent, and then tries to tell you how you should live to make other people feel happy, to help other help other people feel supported, equal. It, you know, it's mind bending hypocrisy, but it is the status quo of the media and modern elite at every turn. Uh, Lorenz is like just there, you know, their their sort of chosen target this time around. So let's see where this goes. I don't think anyone's going to get hurt, but uh, Washington Post is a pretty big outfit. CNN obviously a big outfit. Let's see what kind of power Taylor Lorenz actually has. Well, she's from a connected family, so she she's going to tap into these resources. But well, move on. And looks like Russia they're back at it. And this story, it's there's BlackBerry involved in this. BlackBerry they're still around, and they they dude we had incredible. another story like a month ago. Did we really? I totally forgot yeah, about that. They, they had they found uh, an exploit or something. BlackBerry security, their regime oh, found yeah, it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. the researchers, they're back at it again because according to the researchers at BlackBerry, there is a group known as Cuba Ransomware. Interesting name. This That's group has... Good, let's, let's pause right there. Do you, oh. What do you give that name out of 10? We've, we've done some good names. I think we should start a segment where we name and rate the, uh, or we rate the names of the hacker groups. What do you give that? Well, this can be the first one. This would be the, the, but what, how do you, Cuba? it's a country, not a nice country, but it's okay. Wait, wait, wait. Before we start even, is it like the spelling? Is it the pronunciation? Is it like, how do you dictate a name? Because you could get a far off name that is very difficult to rhyme off. No, nah, you think it's too much about this. You think no, it's too much I, about this. I just have want to know seen, how do I score these? Have you ever seen Cuba ransomware? I give it three have, thumbs down. Have you ever seen Barstool? This is a great, everyone who listens to Access VZ listens for exactly this kind of commentary. The Barstool guy, Dave Portnoy, does these videos then where he orders a pizza from whatever city he's in? Yeah. Maybe he's watching a playoff game. You seen this guy? Takes a bite he did of the pizza Toronto, and then not too long ago. It. Yeah. So, like, do you think that guy asked himself, like, how am I going to rate this pizza? Is it the crust, the cheese? All he does, he looks around, he bites it. It's way too hot for him to even taste anything. And then he says, 7.1. He doesn't know. That's what we're going to do. We're starting our own version of this and we're going to upend the Barstool Empire by naming and rating hacker groups. Uh, now, this I, one, think, I, I already gave it three thumbs down. It's pretty shitty. Three this thumbs one. down. I give yeah. this one, uh, Let's see. What is the name of this one again? Cuba Ransomware. Hmm. <laughs> it's not the greatest name. <laughs> I give it a 4.1. Stamp that on there. Get the video editing team. Stamp on a 4.1 during this part of the show. I can't okay. get enough Keep thumbs going. down. <laughs> okay, so this group Cuba Ransomware, 4.1 or three thumbs down. They've been previously tied to a malware strain known as Rom-Com Rat, and that's five thumbs down. It's the, name <laughs> the rom com <laughs> rat and it's not a cyber crime group at all it's actually a group working for the russian government and they've been targeting ukraine military units and local governments that's according to what the research researchers were saying and rom com rat is a remote access trojan it's first reported back in or uh, discovered back in may of 2022 and it was uh, targeting sectors with ransomware and financial services governments facilities healthcare and just goes on and on and on and they've been reported me using a fake version password manager of keypass we talked about them in the past mm -hmm. another no, another one is called it uh sorry solar winds advanced ip scanner adobe acrobat reader so they're getting involved in all these and they're able to infiltrate this and to make them appear that it's legitimate so it's too bad that they are attacking their enemies because it's making them look even more bad. They're, we'll have to sanction even more Russian cats with the Russian blues because of this. But I'm looking at this and it just it's another story. Russia getting involved in, in cyber crime. Ho-hum, it's, it's happened before. They're going after their enemies. In this case, Ukraine, it's, it is too bad, but it's going to paint them in an even worse light. They should go after somebody else, maybe after China, but whatever. They're friends and... Uh, Good friends, better enemies. We'll see what happens. But yeah, I don't know what else to say about this. Blackberry's involved. They're, the researchers, good for them. Must be a crack team of just a few people, but they're still active. Good for them. And uh, Rom Comrade, how, what would you rank that one? That was six thumbs down, I think. That's a uh, Rom Comrade. That's a 2.8, I think. 4.1 for Cuba Gooding Jr. hackers. And then the other one is uh, Rom Comrade. The French 4, judge 2. is giving 8. it a 3.5, though. So we have to. <laughs> <laughs> we got to look at Let's this. Wish him, all the, wish him all the best. Good job by Jim Balsilli establishing Blackberry. Still kicking today. Too bad he never got that hockey team. <laughs> yeah, it was going to be in Hamilton, wasn't it? Yeah, and everywhere else in Southern Ontario. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was the one I understand. It, he was awfully close to using, I don't know what it's called now, but it then was Cops Coliseum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
they were going to move the Quebec Nordiques. I think that was the or the Winnipeg it? Jets. I think that's one of the two. Maybe but this is a long yeah. time ago. Good question. I don't know. We'll talk about that on next week's episode, which is number 300. God bless everyone. Thanks for listening, watching. Don't forget, sign up for the email newsletter, accessvz.com, and we will see you next week. Yeah, take care.